we're working our way through not only the Gospel of Luke, but also a teaching on prayer prompted by uh, Luke's presentation of Jesus' teaching about prayer with the Lord's Prayer and then some further teaching uh, in Luke chapter 11. So today we're going to begin, though, as we look to Jesus' command to you and me that we pray for God's kingdom to come. We're going to begin with Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, because to even begin to understand what Jesus is saying when he commands us to pray, your reign come, your kingdom come. We need to understand some key passages, including certainly Daniel 7, 13 and 14. So here now, the word of God from Daniel chapter 7, and then we'll also be turning to three passages from Luke's gospel. So Daniel 7, 13 through 14. I saw, Daniel says, in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. You need to remember that, that term, son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him, to this one who was like the son of man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, or reign, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, his reign, his malkut, one that shall not be destroyed. Now then to the Gospel of Luke, you will remember that the revolution begins contra not only all the Jewish authorities, but also the Roman Empire. And we get this revolutionary annunciation to this little virgin who's living in Nazareth named Mary. And just one verse from this announcement of the gospel revolution to her, speaking about the coming of this child that's going to be conceived in her, even as she's a virgin. Luke chapter 1, verse 33, And he will reign, this son of hers, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Jesus, as he's beginning his ministry, his public ministry, uh, when people are trying to make him stay for another day where he is in Galilee, he said, but he said to them, this is Luke 4, 43, he said to them, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom. What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news of God's reign, the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, because I was sent for this purpose. This is the reason I came to earth, to proclaim the revolutionary good news of God's reign, God's kingdom. And so therefore, Jesus then, when he's teaching us and commanding us how to pray, we get to this in Luke chapter 11, verse 2. And he said to them, when you, that's plural, y'all, when y'all pray, say, Father, May your name be honored as holy, and then our emphasis for today, may your reign, may your kingdom, your rule, come. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. And we've been talking about throughout this series of sermons, and I want you to continue to reflect on this, and God is inviting you and me to grow in our faith and faithfulness, not only individually, but in our families, if you're married, in your marriage, if you have children with your children, whatever your context is right now with your friends, community, as you're single, prayer is the clearest expression of our actual faith. And the clearest expression of our actual relationship with God. So again, I'm encouraging you and honestly challenging you to analyze your life. To analyze where your heart is, where your soul is, and where you invest your time. Because again, if you tell me, well, I honestly don't spend a lot of time in prayer. I'm going to say, okay, <laughs> you don't have much of a faith relationship with God. You don't think much of God because you think other things trump God, bump out God because you've got more important things to do than to spend time with God, and you don't have much of a relationship with him. 
If I said to a married person, how much do you talk to your spouse? And they said, well, I occasionally call in if there's a problem once or twice a week, I'd say, we need to do some marriage counseling. This is not, this is not a good marriage. So it really reflects your relationship. Where are you? I wanna encourage you as we move through now heading into summer, grow in your relationship with God, grow in your knowledge of God, your understanding of God, your, your understanding of how important God is. Reframe your life for prayer. In Augustine's Confessions, he says this, wherever one's soul turns, unless toward God, it cleaves to sorrow. And he goes on and says this, even though the things outside God, like our family, like beautiful art, like a piece of property we own, like a lake, like going fishing, whatever, even though the things outside God and outside the soul to which it cleaves may be things of beauty, if we put the lake or going fishing or our children above God, then we're headed towards sorrow. That's just a reality long term. One way to summarize what Augustine teaches, and this is biblically based, is what we love and long for most shapes our soul and our character. And you think about it. Even a secular person would have to acknowledge this. What we first love, what, what our first love is, what our main love is, what gets us up in the morning, what we invest ourselves and our time into, and what we long for, what we, we're hoping for, shapes our soul and our character. And the reality is this, unless God, unless the Lord Jesus is the one you're longing for and loving first, your soul and your character are gonna be compromised. So you're either headed towards degradation or sanctification. To be sanctified is increasingly to look to and reflect Jesus more and more. That's just a spiritual reality of life and it certainly applies to prayer. So on the point of prayer as part of the rest of our lives, I only have one fill in the blank today on the notes, so here it is. This is the big point here. This is the big invitation now. Pray blank. What goes in that blank? Love blank. Live blank to our King's victory and to our eternity with Him. And here's the answer. Pray forward. Pray ahead into his victory and your eternity with him. Love forward. Love ahead. Have your heart looking beyond the immediate. Love ahead into Jesus' return, his victory, and your eternity with him. Because, see, that, that's going to shape your character and your spiritual growth so differently if you're looking ahead. Live forward to his victory. Serve. Make choices in, in what you do. Make choices in serving his kingdom that is coming and your eternity with him. Makes all the difference in the world. Which is, in other words, why Jesus says, pray like this. Before you get to anything about yourself, pray first. May your kingdom, may your reign come. Father, may your name be upheld as holy, and may your kingdom, may your reign come, before I get to anything else. As Jesus puts it elsewhere, for instance in Luke 12, 31, first seek God's kingdom before you do anything else. And look, he knows you need other stuff. You know, he knows you need food. He knows you want your children to get educated. He knows you... You need to have a job, you know. Yeah, I get to that, but that's second underneath praying for his kingdom and his reign. A challenging passage is also incredibly inspiring is from Paul's second letter to his protege, Timothy, the pastor at Ephesus. And the Apostle Paul says this. This is Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, 
Now, before I get anywhere else on this verse, just notice this. Crown of righteousness. What does that sound like? That sounds like a kingdom, doesn't it? And people who are going to be part of a kingdom, right? But, but what Paul is really talking about here is eternal salvation. Because anybody who is going to be in heaven and in heavenly communion, in heaven and on earth with God, is going to be crowned in Christ's righteousness, okay? So that's what Paul is talking about. This is not just a special award. This is like the, the center of everything. There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. That means the day of his return, the day of the Lord, okay, the consummation of the kingdom. Paul says, I will receive the crown of righteousness. In other words, be a member of the kingdom. I'll be in on the kingdom, which he's going to award me. Jesus will award me. Will you be in on that? Well, let's keep reading. That he will award to me, and Paul says, and not only to me, but also to all who, has, who have loved his appearing. Now here, this is a great message. In other words, everybody who truly loves the Lord and longs first and foremost for his appearing will also receive the crown of righteousness and be in eternal glory in the kingdom of God. But let me ask you this, is that what you're loving right now? Again, when you wake up in the morning, when you navigate through the day making your decisions, is your first love seeing Jesus face to face? Can you just not wait until you get to see Jesus face to face? See, Paul says the crown of righteousness is going to be given by Jesus the judge, not only to me, but to everyone else who's, in other words, a true Christian who actually loves his second coming, who is longing for it, praying for it, you know, moving in that direction. And what does that mean, this appearance of the Lord? Well, if you go back to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, at the beginning of this passage, Paul charges Timothy in two different ways. He charges Timothy to keep the faith, by the way. He charges Timothy to be faithful in his ministry in two different ways. He charges him in God and Christ, who will judge the living and the dead. Okay, he charges him in God and in Christ. And then he says, talking about Jesus, by his appearing and kingdom. So Paul charges Timothy by Jesus' appearing and his kingdom. Do you see what's happening there? In other words, what two things go together? Jesus' second coming and the consummation of the kingdom. And Paul is charging his protege. He says, if you, if you miss everything else, I want you to get this. Live your life faithful to Jesus' appearing and his kingdom that comes with his appearing. And that's what Jesus is talking about when he's teaching us to pray. So I want to invite you into that. So let's talk about the kingdom. Uh, New Testament theologians for the last couple of generations, this is what I was taught when I was um, learning the scriptures, and this is a good point of reference, is the kingdom of God in the New Testament, where we are with Jesus' first coming, but he hasn't come again yet, the kingdom of God is already but not yet. That's the famous summary, right? The kingdom of God is already but not yet. In other words, Jesus came and he brought the kingdom, but it's not fully consummated because he has to come again, right? So the kingdom of God is already but not yet. I'm going to add to this, though, and I've got it in your notes, I think. I know I've got it up on the screen. The kingdom of God is already but not yet, but is coming in full. It is coming in full. Don't just say, well, it's already but not yet, and that's the end of the story. No, the, the, here, here's the consummation of the story. The kingdom is, is coming in full and will be all in all when? When he appears, when he returns. So again, Paul says, the crown of righteousness is for me and for everybody who's loving that great celebration and consummation that is to come. So, you know, this past week, we commemorated, uh, there was a great commemoration for the 80th anniversary of the D-Day landing and invasion, most massive, most important amphibious landing, military landing in uh, the 20th century and really in some ways in, in modern history. And I thank um, Dr. Craig Arhus and our famous maroon marching band and other people from Mississippi State who were there. Richard, thank you for helping facilitate all that you do. A great remembrance. Well, let's think about D-Day, though, and I'm going to go to an analogy in a moment. But to understand D-Day, 
you have to understand that D-Day was part of a, of course, much larger story, but a very specific line of a story here because D-Day and where the invasion happened, it's pretty interesting. It did not happen in the easiest place to land in northern France, which is what the Germans were anticipating. They were anticipating, of course they were thrown off by the diversion with Patton up in England too, but they were anticipating the landing at Calais. Okay? But Eisenhower didn't plan the landing that way because he planned a much more difficult landing uh, to prong. It was gonna be much more difficult in the initial hours but if you got over the hump, and almost literally the hump, then all of a sudden, what happened in the days after was gonna go much more easily. Because the forces of Germany were much more heavily arrayed to defend against the invasion at Calais. So, but the, the problem is you had to get over the hump, and literally this is the hump, this is the Pointe du Hoc, uh, which is this, you know, promontory out there, this 99-foot cliff that the rangers had to scale, right, but while being shot at by the Germans and all kind of artillery up there. So it's, it's a challenge at the beginning, but if you get over it, new things happen. And of course, Eisenhower wasn't just thinking about day one, he's thinking about day two, day three. And in fact, if you really understand D-Day and strategy, Eisenhower and the leaders were already thinking all the way from D-Day to another day. What's the, what's the next day? The, it's V-E day. So in other words, you're already seeing through the challenges to the victory, do you follow me? And then, but even at V-E day, you've got to think ahead if you're really strategic, right? Because you've got V-E day, the great celebration, the victory is finally won, but what about the day after V-E day? And what about the era after V-E day? How is Europe going to be restored and reconstituted? So you're thinking ahead, right? So in other words, you're not just kind of an ant who just thinks about the task at hand for the next five seconds. You're looking beyond. Uh, by the way, it's interesting. Uh, the D-Day invasion happened a lot later than what the English wanted and expected, and definitely what Stalin and the Soviet Union wanted and expected. But Eisenhower took his time and did the slow motion to get it right, get all the logistics right and to do it at the right time. So there's an analogy there for us in the faith. You think about Christ coming. It came a lot later than what many of the faithful people of Israel had hoped for and prayed for for centuries before, right? And then it came in a really surprising way. I mean, who would ever come up with this? Certainly the opposition, the enemy, Satan and the world powers didn't expect this, that the Messiah comes as a little fetus that has to grow in Mary's womb for nine months, really? Like up in Nazareth? And, and, and then he, he's born as a little helpless baby in a podunk town that nobody's ever heard of since David called Bethlehem? And then he's gonna have to grow up like a little, a regular little boy? This just doesn't make any sense, right? And then, by the way, he's going to have to go, not the, not the easy landing, he's actually going to be enthroned on a cross. I mean, the point du hope pales in comparison to what Jesus is going to go through, right? Then you're going to get to the resurrection, amazingly, the resurrection, the gathering of the church, the ascension, and the ascending of the church in mission. But you see, Jesus is already looking through the cross, and looking through his first coming all the way to what happens at his return and the era that comes after that, the glorious kingdom of God consummated and what he's inviting you and me to believe and to begin to see, we see dimly, but to begin to see by the Holy Spirit is to look ahead and pray through the big picture. In other words, look ahead beyond D-Day and speaking of D-Day, just to play off the D-Day, what is your game plan after death day for you? Where are you headed? What are you seeing beyond death? Or is it all about just the here and now, right? See, Jesus is inviting you to see beyond D-Day in all kinds of ways, to look beyond to the glory of his kingdom. The scripture keeps telling this over and over again to us. 
uh, Revelation 5, verses 9 and 10, and they sang a new song saying, and they're singing to the Lamb who was slain, who's now standing, in other words, the risen Jesus who is in heaven, who has the authority to open the seals to bring forth the, the consummation of God's will. Uh, they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You remember Daniel 7? Same language, right? Same language, gathering people from all, every tribe, language, and nation. And you have made them, what have you made them into, Jesus? A kingdom and priest to our God. And they shall do what? Float around on clouds in heaven? No, they shall reign on earth. In other words, like Paul would say, with crowns of righteousness, in the power of Christ, as representatives of his kingdom. Are you seeing ahead? Are you praying ahead to this? This is, if, if you're a Christian, this is what the Bible is calling, this is what Jesus is commanding you to do. So here's my goal, that my love, prayers, and life are on the right road. May your love, your first love, may your prayers, and may your life be on the right road. We're increasingly, I see, like Paul did, this is Philippians chapter one, verse 21. Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is what? A great tragedy, the end of the story. For me to die is gain, victory. Oh, I can't wait. It's gonna be awesome when I die and see Jesus face to face and then join him in the age to come as he consummates his kingdom. That's what Paul says, eternity with the king. So again, the key thing that I want you to get today is to pray, love, and live forward to our king's victory and to our eternity in his reign. That's Jesus' way for us to pray. That's what he's teaching us to pray. You know, after the address to the Father, and before we get to all our petitions for ourselves to pray the adoration petitions thy name be hallowed thy kingdom come if you go through the scriptures God's words on our identity and calling as human beings is we're made in the image of God why well the pharaohs and other world powers and rulers in those days in the ancient days they would put little statues of themselves or representing their kingdom out to guard and mark their territory. But how does God do it? God doesn't make little unliving, non-living, inanimate statues, does he, to mark his kingdom? What does he do? He makes us in his image. So in other words, it's not a statue in Pharaoh's image or the ruler of Babylon's image. You're made to image God and to show this is my territory. That's what's going on in Genesis 1 and 2. But of course, uh, Satan leads us to besmirch because the problem is we want to be in charge. We don't want to just be representatives of God's dominion. We want to take over and do it our way. We want to put ourselves on the throne. So you go through the scriptures and it's this ongoing story. But you know when God calls Israel, why does he call them Sinai? When you get to Exodus 19, what does God commission them to be? A kingdom of priests, right? people who have a direct relationship with him and who are a kingdom together. Israel's supposed to be ushering in the whole kingdom thing, the restoration after the fall, but of course they don't. They fall immediately. They're at Sinai itself while Moses is waiting on the Ten Commandments. But you know, you go on in the story and the, the Psalms and the prophets start talking about over and over again, this theme of God's kingdom and God's reign. In fact, a classic theological book on the Psalms, James Luther Mays, uh, uh, he, he, sums up, uh, he sums up what the Psalms are all about, what ties all this diverse collection of the Psalms together. And he says the theme running from the laments all the way through the praises, all the way to the glory ones is, in, in Hebrew it's Yahweh Malach, the Lord, that's the personal name for God, reigns. And the laments, when things are bad, they ask God to rise up and rule, okay? So that's what you pray for when you're in trouble, when Israel's in trouble. You ask God to rule because God is truly the king and should be king on earth. 
So the, prof the prophets, and really not just the literal prophets, but also all the way back into the law and the Psalms, you get these prophecies looking ahead to something even more amazing than that, that God is going to come on earth in person as the king to reign. And you get different prophecies about a servant who's going to come and give his life. You get prophecies about an anointed son of David who's going to rule as God himself on earth. This is all talking about the Messiah who's going to come, which brings us to the New Testament. And guess who that is? Jesus, right? Now, this brings us into this reality that the New Testament is all about the kingdom of God. In the Gospels themselves, just the four first four books of the New Testament, the word basileo to theo, or basileo su, the kingdom, your kingdom, the kingdom of God, is used 118 times. When Jesus is summing up the gospel, almost always, it's the good news of the kingdom, and of his coming, and of his ultimate consummation. Jesus also has a favorite term for himself. What is that favorite term? Son of man. I've already connected that to you with uh, Daniel chapter 7. This term is used of Jesus 84 times in the Gospels, 84 times. And what we're being told is that Jesus is going to supplant the kingdoms of this world and Satan and establish what Daniel saw and records in Daniel chapter 7. So, practically speaking, how do we pray? Well, parents... And whether, whether you're not a parent, I don't care. The Westminster Shorter Catechism Summary that we included, I included in the worship today, use it. And you can follow the notes. Now, I've broken it out into four parts, and here's what you're praying for when you pray, Thy kingdom come, or may your reign be established, Lord. Number one, you're going to pray, and you're going to be a revolutionary when you're praying this now. Because both Jesus and Paul say that Satan is the ruler of this present age. That he's the king of this earth right now. He has temporary authority. But you're a revolutionary against that when you believe in Jesus. So you are going to pray that Satan's kingdom be destroyed, as the Shorter Catechism says. You're going to revolt against Satan. I talked about this a lot in the Palm Sunday sermon, The Edge of Eternity, Love's Victory. You can go back and check that for more depth here on March 24, the edge of eternity. But remember, Jesus says this incredible thing when he's being accused of being in league with Satan because he's casting out demons, and Jesus says, that's so stupid, a house divided against itself. And then he says this in chapter 11, verse 20 of Luke. But if by the finger of God I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So he's saying... When I drive out these demons, it's not just a, a you know, magic show. I am in revolt against and overturning the kingdom of Satan. That's what I'm signaling to you. The whole Old Testament is being fulfilled in this direction. And then again, when the 72 return with joy, this is in Luke chapter 10, verse 17 and 18, they, they, they say, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. The revolution has begun. So Jesus says this in verse 18. He said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. He's already seen it. See, all the way through D-Day and beyond, he's seen it, and he's telling you this is happening. Secondly, uh, the, the catechism tells us, and I'm telling us, pray that the kingdom of grace may be advanced. The kingdom of grace may be advanced. Revolt against the world's strongholds, including the way the world's strongholds have you <laughs> deceived, okay? So how is the kingdom of grace advanced? I've already talked about this. It's not like what we would expect. Jesus says the kingdom of God is like a little mustard seed that slowly but surely grows and comes to dominate, okay? Um, remember his first coming? Right, it seems like Caesar Augustus is in charge. But Caesar Augustus, Luke chapter 2, tells us is only the servant who sets up where Jesus is supposed to be born. And that's all he is, and we never hear from him again. Caesar Augustus, the most powerful man on earth at the time and in that age, ends up paling in comparison to this baby born in Bethlehem. All the way through the story. But Jesus, in Luke chapter 17, verse 20 and 21, being asked by the Pharisees 
when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that you can observe it. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. In other words, he's saying, look, world, the kingdom of God is going already in people who believe in me. If you see it and respond to it, you can be saved. If you don't, you're missing the whole story. I love it at the end of Acts. Paul is there, you know, basically under house arrest in Rome for two years. And Acts closes with him proclaiming the kingdom of God to anybody who will listen. Doesn't sound really propitious, right? Paul's probably going to die in Rome. Nobody's ever going to hear from him again, right? Uh, no, not quite, if you read the New Testament. Revelation chapter 12 tells us what's going on. There's a war in heaven, and the serpent, the great Satan, is cast out. He was thrown down to the earth, and the, his angels were thrown down with him. This is Revelation chapter 12. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them day and night before our God, has been thrown down. And they've conquered him by what? By great weapons? By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto facing death. Because of this rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, because the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that he only has a short time. Does it seem like to you the world powers are getting worse now? Seems like the rulers maybe are even more off kilter than they were 10, 20, 30 years ago. Revelation chapter 12, right? Verse 12. There it is. That's what's going on. Jesus calls us to pray for and join in the revolutionary mission of his kingdom, and he warns, and here's his judgment now. You're either in with him or you're not. Luke 11, verse 23. After talking about the finger of God, if I do this by the finger of God, the kingdom has come, he says, whoever is not with me is against me. You can't play it neutral. And then he says this, whoever does not gather with me scatters. If you're not engaged in his ministry, you're scattering. Get in the ministry, Christian. Join in the kingdom work. So leads us to three. Pray that we be brought into and kept in the kingdom of grace. Paul sums this up beautifully in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. Here's what's happened with our salvation. God has delivered us from the domain of darkness, that means the kingdom of Satan, and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now, y'all know if you follow sports and my comments on sports, I don't like the transfer portal system right now in college sports, but this is the one transfer portal I really like when God, by the grace through Jesus Christ, transfers us off of Satan's team onto his team. It doesn't get any better than that, does it? So that's what Paul is saying in, first, in, in, excuse me, in, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. He's delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So here's my thing to you today. Who's on the throne for you? If you're on the throne, if you're making your own decisions, get off the throne. Who's supposed to be on the throne? Jesus. So pray it. Thy kingdom come. Not my kingdom come. Thy kingdom come, which leads us to number four. Pray the kingdom of glory comes quickly and revolt against anything that holds you back from wanting Jesus to come today and loving Jesus' return first and foremost in your life. What's holding you back? Is it the lake? Is it going fishing this afternoon? Is it your kid's graduation from some program in a few years? Is it you just want to make a little more money so you can enjoy life next year or next decade better? Are you crazy? Get off the throne. Don't let this stuff hold you back from longing for and loving his appearing right now. So revolt against everything in yourself and the way you've been deceived by the world powers, the powers and principalities of this age and Satan to put other things in front of loving and wanting his return. Anything that is barring you from seriously, spiritually praying, thy kingdom come, 
Get it off the throne. Get yourself off the throne and look to Jesus alone as your king. That's what the catechism is telling you. What's holding you back? Revolt against it. Pray that the kingdom of glory come quickly. How to pray. Here's how to pray. Final prayer in Revelation. It's the second to last verse. Revelation 22, verse 20. He who testifies, in other words, Jesus, to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. That's what Jesus says. So what am I supposed to pray in response to this? Revelation 22, verse 20. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. In other words, thy kingdom come. So I am calling you, and I'm calling myself today, to accept the invitation. It's a great invitation to be in on the seventh trumpet, the great celebration, right? Then the seventh angel, this is Revelation 11, blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and guess what? Just like we've been seeing all in scripture, he shall reign forever and ever. In other words, I'm inviting you to join in the chorus of Handel's Messiah. The kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ have become the kingdom of this world, and he shall reign. Not me, not me shall reign, <laughs> not I shall reign. He shall reign forever and ever. In other words, I'm inviting you to pray and love and live forward to our king's victory and eternity with him. See through D-Day, see beyond VE Day, see the big story. Join in the gospel revolt. Seek God's kingdom. Sing joy to the world. The Lord has come and see it and pray for it. Or in other words, is Jesus' disciple specifically command you to pray? Pray to God the Father. Thy kingdom come. May you reign now. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.